I'm sure there's been countless Pascals that have been grown in tubes. Yeah, we brought a canary on the track in case there's a leakage of coal dust. <laughs> you can't be too careful. <laughs> Marty, they, I fast charged. <laughs> they said JK had been infused back in time. <laughs> Nick DeVries does not bite people. He only bites your furniture. Okay, he does not bite you. He's great around kids. Love Island boy. Dennis, he's laying down rubber and not putting on rubbers. We are gonna, we are gonna start a GoFundMe for the ERT team uh, in order to try to get them some goddamn points. Welcome to Circuit Breakers, the grid preview special. My name is Dallas, joined alongside me is Taylor, and in this episode, we are going to be walking through the Formula E paddock and breaking down all the teams, all the drivers. Taylor, we tried to do this episode, actually we didn't even try, we did. I'm looking at a draft in the YouTube channel, but you weren't entirely comfortable with uh, us pushing this out. You felt like it wasn't really uh, up to snuff with what we're trying to do here, right? Look, we I, there's a there's a lot to I think performing on the internet that I have never done before. It's breaking off a lot of nerves, and I think um, collectively after we sat down and we listened to the episode, we realized that we just weren't um, making the jokes that and and in ways that we felt was a best reflection of the care and the value that we have uh, for not only just the quality work that we put out, but for the podcast that we want to build. So we're coming back through and we're doing this all over again, now having found kind of the right rhythm of what we think we care most about. Yeah. And this episode is great for a multitude of viewers and listeners. If you're brand new to Formula E, you're going to be introduced to these drivers and these teams, get to look at it, maybe a different angle that you weren't expecting. And then even if you're a seasoned Formula E fan, I I would doubt, I'd put money on it, that you haven't taken a look at the drivers uh, in this sort of light. So Taylor, with that being said, uh, who is the first team and, and driver duo that we're going to be talking about? Yeah, so uh, first team for us, um, we're going straight into um, Neil McLaren, who uh, recently picked up uh, the grids divorced dad, Sam Bird. Um, Sam Bird going through a bit of a grid life crisis um, after uh, bouncing around to two separate teams over the last couple years. Um, recently had a divorce with Jaguar uh, after fighting for custody of that race seat for what felt like a couple of years, um, but has found a new home here at Neo McLaren alongside um, Jake Hughes. And <laughs> every single time that I look at Jake Hughes, I feel like he was just picked off of picked up off of a, like a little like industrial revolution street corner of like Victorian London <laughs> and just dropped across time directly into a race seat. Like there's something about him that just looks like dirty little ch like chimney sweep, you know, like yeah, coal worker. Like he's on the like he, yeah, like a coal <laughs> worker. Like he's spending his days uh, in the mines. Uh, um, rolling rolling steel over hard presses uh only to uh, arrive at the race circuits um <laughs> and it's it's impossible it's impossible like he should be on the corner uh begging for change uh but spare <laughs> high penny please <laughs> yeah you you have the best uh you have the best impersonations of um the hey penny lifestyle that that i've ever heard so we're lucky on that well, and my theory is just to build onto this lore, which we will continue to do with J.K. Penny Hughes, is uh, back in, you know, the, what would that be, the 18th century, uh, Jacob Hughes, the second, uh, is working in the coal mines, just down deep, dark, dusty. He's like, oh, I'm making coal, and I'm mining coal, and I'm doing my thing. And then he hits his axe on, like, a crack, and then just sees the light. Like, oh, no, what's this? He peers into it, and then he falls into this time shaft slip, and then falls straight into the Neil McLaren car right before a race. 
and it's like all right jake you gotta go over it off we go and i just i guess learned how to drive a car as he fell through a hundred some odd years or 200 some odd years of time and now he's racing in formula e yeah i love that he's the only guy for this race seat like <laughs> there's no one else we need this uh how, what is he, 24-year-old kid with the skin of a 78-year-old on the circuit? <laughs> He's probably put in requests to the team and maybe uh, race control. Like, yeah, we put a canary on the track in case there's a leakage of coal dust. You <laughs> can't be too careful. I think that's enough on McLaren. Um, you want to start getting things a little more steamy moving over to the Andretti side of the garage? Yes, moving away from Hey Penny and the divorced dad, uh, talking about Andretti, uh, currently the reigning defending champion from season nine, Jake, Love Island boy, Dennis, just objectively the most handsome driver on the grid. Uh, he's laying down rubber and not putting on rubbers. He's teamed up with a uh, former Nissan driver as of the season before, Norman Nato. Uh, so these two are making up Andretti, and I know this is a um, supposed to be like a standalone episode and it's kind of separate from the season, but I, I can't help but critique that Andretti at least is not off to the hottest start as they were last year than I had expected. Yeah, there was Diria. There was a huge margin that Jake Dennis had pulled away for that first round there, but then the next night struggled said it was the worst car that he ever drove but taylor what do you make of these andretti boys i do think that like norman natto having moved from nissan you know he struggled kind of at the start and last year with andre lotterer um really there was just like no other driver like it was just jake dennis alone every single race um, having a more steady set of hands to complement Jake Dennis uh, in that Andretti team seemed like it was going to be a recipe for success. Um, and I think as we keep going, there's so many more races in the season. Um, we're going to see probably a more consistent outcome. I think last year what we saw from Norman is that he was a little slow at the start. And once he kind of got to grips with everything, the team, he was able to really start putting in strong performances towards the end, consistently landing the points. And maybe that's the case now. So maybe there's just some, you know, beginner's nerves, something I'm familiar with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, in, order to, in order to find that um, confidence to really get out there and send it where it's needed. I think that I still am on board with backing this Andretti outfit for success. Um, do I think lightning is going to strike twice? I think it's going to be hard to make that happen. Um, but as we've seen some, from some of the timing beams, sometimes two lightning strikes is all it takes in mm -hmm. order to get the right gap. Let's go ahead and move over to, I think, our most beloved <laughs> cartoon character team in Envision Racing. First off, we're starting out with Count Buemi. Um, the team's championship uh, from season nine, um, Buemi, I think, single-handedly had some of the worst luck. Uh, his spit trap was constantly full of his uh, spewing mutterings. Um, and he uh, also simultaneously managed to destroy the driver's championship for Nick Cassidy in those closing races um because of just communication errors um but sebastian buemi who we've dubbed the count um he is truly i think just the waluigi of formula e he yeah. is a, he's just yeah. passionate and he's cranky he's this weirdo who's just throwing a fit at every single corner he has like signature noises too like bah! Uh, <laughs> like every time but the thing that i love most about him is he is waging war not with other drivers on the grid but just with misfortune like his luck <laughs> yeah. is just the most at odds thing i think his 
entire racing career, he has had more wrecks happen one car length ahead of him than any other driver, where he could be just doing absolutely magic on the track. And he is going to have, I don't know, the last place car uh, slip into a barrier and there's going to be no race control messages and he's going to just drive over a piece of shrapnel and end his race. It's um, he's He has that kind of like um, cartoon villain quality where like, <laughs> He'll have everything going for him, and then just like a like a pin in a floorboard will pop the tire of his car, and he'll spiral out. Um, yeah, uh, Buemi is, I think, one of my favorite drivers to watch at every point, and to look forward to every team radio for. Yes. Um, yep. And I, I, I hurt my hand really badly. He is the count. Count Buemi is what he will be referred to until the end of time and beyond time because he is in this land of the undead. So maybe there's something to say about something he had to conjure up in order to go out and participate in these day races because uh, vampires, other undead creatures typically are known as, you know, they are creatures of the night. So maybe he gets to race (laughs) in Formula E but the caveat to whatever agreement he made, whatever spell he cast, whatever, is that he's not going to be fortunate in his his uh, trials and tribulations of of racing. Yeah, exactly. Um, but he's also got another um, near death survivor uh, coming up. Well, at least I guess the death of a wrist uh, more than anything. Um, returning to his home team of Envision uh, is. The man with the glass wrists, Robin Frines. Um, he has already shown us that racing clean is his priority. Um, who knows uh, what the medical bill for that surgical implant on his wrist is, or even how legal it is. Uh, in <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Some Mexican stem cells. Um, yeah, who knows? Uh, but we're just, I'm just, I, frankly, I'm so excited to see Robin back into um, like a front running team or a competitive powertrain because in apt last year, you could see him really pushing that car as far as it could go. Um, you know, I'm thinking of like the, the one, two pole in the wet with that apt Cupra last year in Berlin. Like that was a master class of just how to outdrive a car and the worst conditions. Um, so seeing him back in in race seat that probably will serve him best uh, is incredible. But I do also love that Robin Fryens very much like keeps himself kind of in the shadows of uh, of some of the other drivers. Like he is probably one of the more capable uh, contenders on in the field. But he is in many ways like the phantom. Like we have the count mm. and we have the phantom. Yeah. Um, the, the, the team of the undead over there at Envision. Um, but frankly, I have no idea how this uh, how this pair is going to stack up. Yeah, there's um, some history between these two drivers dating back before my time in watching Formula E, but I did see it pop up on my YouTube algorithm. Uh, the Count and the Phantom got into it, and it mainly was Sebastian Buemi coming up to him and, you know, kind of putting, putting his face in his face. But... How do you feel that dynamic is going to play out, especially with, you know, Envision's admin having to deal with, uh, I'm sure there were spats last year with Boemi and Nick Cassidy. I mean, that tends to happen when you fuck your teammate off on a world championship opportunity. So, yeah, just the dynamic of these two drivers in this one team. What were your thoughts on that when you saw that uh, Robin Frines was coming back to Envision and Buemi was staying? Well, I think I think more than anything, it's like the tale of two opposites, right? Like you have Buemi who overstates his desire to win, but understates the feasibility of how to win. Uh, and with um, Frines, I think he is so reserved and calculating that he in in many ways like understates his desire to win but has all of the tools to make like victory happen uh and to be a world champion like i i'm still waiting for that and i think that time is starting to slip and it's really going to take a huge like push to make that happen um but I think he is always going to be somewhere in the slipstream ready to snap at 
an overtake that's going to change a tide of a race. And that's one of the things that I love about uh, about Frines. Uh, Buemi is going to always lead into a place and slowly lose that position to someone who is just more patient. Um, and so it's kind of a, it's kind of like a, a yin and yang situation between the two of them. Um, and maybe that's what it takes to find harmony. Maybe that's what this team needs. What's up, you E-heads? It's that time of the show for you to get off of the racing line and into attack mode to give this show a boost. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like this episode and subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening on an audio platform, head on over to YouTube at Circuit Breakers Pod and do the very same thing. It gives us that algorithmic boost that really gets our wheels turning. So thank you. And back to the show. The next team... Apt Cupra and specifically their seasoned veteran driver, Lucas DeGrassi, because as long as this guy is on the track, you had mentioned this in the Sao Paulo recap, the dude's a butcher. Uh, it doesn't matter who he's racing for, it doesn't matter who he's racing against, he's gonna try and get a piece of the rest of the field. And he is teamed up with a youngin in Nico Muller. Now DeGrassi was at Mahindra last year. Not a great team. Again, not a great team this year, at least as performance goes. And he moves over to Apt, which is also not good. Uh, so do you have any expectations for the Cooper clan? And if they can make anything happen or they're just there to be a part of the grid? You know, I think that they're just stuck in a hard place um, because I do think Apt is an incredible racing team um i mean historically one of the most winningest uh formula e teams ever i mean uh, the apt audi combo was incredible uh and that's where lucas degrassi saw most of his success in this and i think that's where he was kind of like looking to jump back into um but frankly i don't know if lucas degrassi has the patience for being at the back of the grid. I think that there's going to be a lot of flare ups constantly throughout this entire season with apt probably continuing that struggle with that Mahindra power unit. Um, I frankly, I don't think apt is going to want to stay in this if they're going to be continually stranded with that uh, power unit from Mahindra or if there's no more growth in that power unit. So I think that there is going to be either a like, final season for Lucas uh, where he just cannot find another place on the grid um, or he is going to work desperately hard to find the footing that the team needs in order for some breakout performances but I think that there's kind of just bad taste in his mouth and he's racing um, out of spite almost right now versus uh, for passion um, and he is a passionate man. You know, I think there's few things in this world that that guy loves more than motorsport and Formula E, frankly. So I don't want this season to be like a dark mark on his racing career, but it's unfortunately looking like it may turn out to be um, with just the direction that the team seems to be working. Um, Nico Muller, um, has, he showed a lot of growth uh, over the past couple of years. I think he spent the most time in that app uh, and is maybe the most comparable of any of the Mahindra power unit drivers. And I think you're going to start seeing his performances continue to grow as he's maybe the most comfortable with how bad that car is. Last year, you know, Berlin, they had that, Muller and Freins had an amazing qualifying one too uh, in wet weather conditions. They really show just what capable drivers they are. Um, and in the wet weather, you know, kind of the field is neutralized as far as performance advantages. And they just showed that they can control that car and make it what it needs to be. So I don't have a lot of uh, high hopes for apt. Um, I think that they're mostly going to be fighting to not be in last place. Uh, I think there's three teams that are going to be really fighting to not be last. Um, but I'm not sure which one will unfortunately take that prize. I do in my head. We haven't talked about them yet. I think it's, it's tough to beat being in last of one of the teams that are coming up, but they're not here yet. Oh, some more coverage of this specific <laughs> team. Are we, some, are we, is that what we're doing? We, all right. Here's the thing about making content. You have to keep them engaged in the intrigue of what team <laughs> could that possibly be? Oh, we man. will get to it. 
Nissan is next on this list. Uh, Sasha Fenny, the Fenestraz. The Fenestraz. Um, yeah, he whipped around last season uh, for a rookie year. It's pretty impressive. Uh, sophomore year uh, is just like it's just time to build. And again, I feel like coming in as a rookie when everyone is coming into a brand new car just really lets you kind of rise. Uh, this sophomore year is going to be much harder. I think everyone's got their hands on just how hard this car is to drive. Um, so we're going to need to start seeing some more breakout performances from him. I most notably recognized his like courage and tenacity in qualifying last year. Um, he made it in the points a few times, also had some gnarly crashes, which is pretty typical of a rookie uh, season. Um, but he's got a new teammate. Uh, as we mentioned, Norman Nato went on over to Andretti. Uh, and good old Ollie Rowland has made his way back to his home team of Nissan. He looks like a weekend warrior. You know, he is truly a dark horse driver, Dallas. Um, historically in the past, I've just like thought he was just too aggressive and not good enough. Uh, constantly getting into wrecks and um, just never quite had that stand up performance. And last year, he just straight up gave up at Mahindra. He left midway through that season. Next thing you know, he's back at Nissan and he's ready to put on performances. Um I think that his constant show of improvement since starting the season, um, now like pulling us directly into a few really highlighted races in his career, um, has been just an untold platform of what this guy's capable of. And on the surface, super unassuming. But when it comes to racing, he locks that minivan. Tosses that Miller High Life can in the recycling, hops in that freaking Nissan, tosses them Oakleys on, and just hoons that thing around the track. Like, he has dinner that he needs to bring home by seven. Earlier today, I was cutting up one of the shorts for Sao Paulo that the center point is Formula E's daddy, Oliver Rowland. And in selecting a track for that video, I couldn't help but pick the Home Depot music bed. And now every time I look at him, that's what I hear in my head. Now, if you're an international listener and you don't have a Home Depot, just go to YouTube, type in Home Depot theme song, Home Depot commercial song, whatever. And you'd be like, oh yeah, this is Oliver Roland. This is what he's jamming. If you see him with headphones on pre-race. Now, when we originally recorded this episode, uh, the season hadn't started yet, or it had, but it had just been Mexico City. It was just one race. We couldn't really make any sort of predictions, but a few more races in. Originally, we were saying, no, Nissan, maybe they kind of showed up late last year. We don't know. But now, Oliver Rowland has taken two out of the four podiums, uh, third place each time. So Nissan may be more legit than what we had originally anticipated. But I think that that kind of leads us into another one of the dark horse teams um, that's just been sniffing around in points since the all of last year even too um, the Penske boys yes DS Penske my biggest disappointment and letdown from last year because John Eric Verne and Stoffel Van Dorn they you just look at them and they have this you know kind of good cop bad cop look to them and you know, those buddy cop movies, when that's the, the dynamic, uh, they usually get shit done. But last year, they rolled out the car. It was this shiny, reflective gold Gen 3, our first look. And they just didn't show up last year. They even had yeah. to cheat a little bit. They had to try and bend yeah. the rules. They ended up breaking the yeah, rules. I what it was it was at portland right they, yeah. uh, they had those tracking devices for some reason put on their cars uh, completely benign but there was an investigation to it and uh and then they got like uh they had to start from the pit lane or something like that and you know every time i think of think back to that um like i it had to have been stoffel that snitched out his team he just like his golden retriever energy like his like do good yeah. qualities <laughs> He couldn't. He couldn't hold that in. He's, he went directly to the FAA. He was like, "I think that we're. Um, I think there's maybe we are um, putting 
in some tracking information into the car. But I think it's a different story this year, Dallas. If it is, um, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, just referencing back to Sao Paulo that just happened, Stoffel barely edged out by Pascal uh, in that pole position, but then just fell back. Like, I don't see the race pace on these cars that, and I didn't get my hopes up because last year I got let down. But I don't see the pace in the races I've seen so far that would complement just how their cars look, just vis visually speaking. Uh, it It's just, it's not there. Not there yet. I'm not saying it won't be there. These are championship drivers. Three world championships out of Formula E are within the seats of the DS Penske. So you can't count them yeah. out. I think they will be some sort of gatekeeper four points but i don't think we will see them you know repeat at the front of the grid battling for a pole they they'll sneak a pole in there for sure but i don't see it as consistent i'm i am a little soured uh with uh i got you know wooed in by the sparkling colors and lights and I got let down. So I am a little sour. Um, so maybe I'm a little too critical on what I've seen so far. Yeah, I mean, I do think that uh, Penske has uh, certainly smoothed out some of the rough edges from last year. Um, I don't think that they have, as a team, not scored in the points yet. Um, I think that, I think, I thinking back to it, I think that they've, both drivers have maybe been in the points. Maybe Stoffel hasn't been in the points for one race. Um, but between Jean-Eric Verne and Stoffel, um, I think that they really are showing up as kind of the uh, the central band uh, of not only just cars that you have to beat, but drivers you have to beat in order to start getting those higher point profiles. Um, and I think that they're, they're they're right there. I mean, we've already got they've already got a poll. Um, They've gotten jean eric Verne, uh, I believe, on a podium. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, he, he P2'd at the first yeah. round in Deria. Yeah, so I, I think that they're absolutely in contention for uh, just a consistent point system uh, between those two drivers, where it seems like there's always a wingman um, to the other's kind of downfalls, and they're able to kind of move up the field or at least hold a uh, solid spaces in the field throughout that race um but time will tell and frankly i think it is up to stoffel to really show himself because i feel like he's been the weaker of the two on the circuit um but uh, yeah i guess looking at the points now through the first four races i guess i kind of misspoke they are currently third in the team's championship and john eric Verne is fourth um i yeah. guess i'm just sour I'm sour from last year, and it's not that I don't want to see them succeed. I just don't want to be hurt again, you know? I think it's time for us to move over to a less familiar team than they were last year to us, Dallas. Um, but the old Neo 333 team has rebranded to ERT for this season. Um, and I needed to do some research to figure out exactly what happened here. Um, uh, so Dallas, you formerly invested in Neo after yes. becoming a <laughs> predominant supporter of the Neo three, three, three racing team. I own um, six shares. Yeah. And so I wish uh, I didn't. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I, so I did some research on the, uh, fallout of what potentially happened. Um, so apparently, uh, I was under the impersonation that Neo was uh, like an actual powertrain manufacturer for this season, but it turns out that um, most of what the Neo racing team was using were off-the-shelf parts, like transmission inverters, all all of those things. Um, and really, this was kind of just like a brand building uh, project for them to try to develop more awareness in Europe. Um, but I think that they found out that it's probably less ideal to um, build up notoriety for your uh, electric supercars that are prevalent in China. Um, if your team that you're sponsoring is a backmarker team every single season. Um, 
So they, I think, uh, implemented an exit clause, uh, basically, I think, signaling the death of the ERT racing team. Um, but Dallas, I, I have to ask, how are your stock prices um, since? They are not great. And I'm, I'm not going to go on and, and give financial advice, but for me, uh, I'm not too happy with my decision to uh, to buy because I bought high, and it wasn't even that high, but it's now very low. I've lost a decent amount of money, <laughs> um, but I'm going to hold. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to hold out. Now, we had talked about a, a battle for the bottom of the grid spot, but ERT, if you haven't figured it out by now, it's that they are kings of the underworld uh in this league they are somehow performing worse and less efficiently than last year which is baffling to me they've gone backwards yeah and we've seen and talked about single lap pace it's a gen 3 car it's got speed but when you get it's these- also a homologation year like yeah, the, they're just the parts stuck with are their they dick still their using hands. the same parts are they burning out are they just like they don't have the funds to to build new parts they yeah they don't have funds the the warehouse where all the parts were stored was on a black book and they don't even know where it is the guy that was with neo left last year so they can't get a hold of him to try and get new ones so they're just i you can't even say they're picking up the pieces they're just maintaining they're trying. We saw in the team radio video at Sao Paulo that no one had the wherewithal to tell Sergio Setacamera that he was out of energy. Uh, even the radio budget. I guess they're paying by the second of the radio wave frequencies to communicate. Uh, it's, it's a damn shame. Um, for the team, it is what it is. Management, mismanagement, call it whatever you would like. But for these two drivers, I feel really bad, especially Danny Boy, Dan Tictum. Uh He is a great driver. He is. And I can see just little inklings oh. of it just begging to burst out in this ERT and in the Neos as well. But he's just he drew a shit flavored straw. I don't think I can name one other sports series that has to Dan take them. No, yeah, like, you cannot. Th- th- he's ready to call his mom to pick him up at the end of a bad race, like over the radio. Um, the he, he just says what's on his mind, and, and it's so refreshing specifically for this, I think, motorsport where everyone, especially like in Formula One, um, they're so buttoned up tight and like uh, rigid uh, to have someone who's ready to like scream and act like a brat uh, because there's no other way for him to be uh, it is a stroke of uh, of paint on of otherwise bare canvas and um, I would be sad to see Dan Tictum go um, I would be very sad to see Dan Tictum go because this team could not find it in them to pick up their pieces and be competitive do it for danny damn it uh before we had made even the first episode of this show and we were just talking uh, about kicking around the idea of starting a formula e podcast i ended up watching a video about dan tictum and the the title was super catchy it was like dan tictum is formula e's or formula one's bad boy and I didn't know the history of it, but with you saying that, you know, Formula One is so, you know, collar tight, just prim and proper, and then watching this video and getting the information that he was booted out of Williams and basically lost his opportunity at a seat there because he was streaming on Twitch or wherever, and then he was like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Latifi is poo 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 and they're like that's unacceptable it's a gross yeah. injustice that they did to the boy um, well he also uh, let's also not gloss over the fact that um, during a uh, yellow flag he cut the chicane specifically to dive bomb oh, no. uh, a rival driver yeah he was going for heads um, I, <laughs> I've said it before I'll say it now and I will say it forever I'm an ERT and Dan Tictum apologist 
Um, sometimes emotion gets the best of you. We've all been super pissed off and done things we regret. If he shows remorse for it, then whatever. It's still an injustice yeah. that because of a little fun, you know, streaming mishap, he lost his F1 seat. Formula E is blessed to have him in this series, even though he is on a dog shit team. Sergio said to camera, just give me a rundown on on this guy, this other part of the ERT squad. Yeah, um, Seta Camera has been going on, I think, four seasons now, right? Like he's been he's been racing for four seasons. Um, he is an incredible driver, really stoic, uh, very poised, but in over fifty entries, has never had a pole or a podium, and. It hurts to see, but um, there are some real strokes of brilliance in Sergio that we've seen over the years. Uh, and I feel like, unfortunately, the, the the struggle with this is that he has always just been in that completely disorganized team that is just not going to work as hard as he is on track. So um, our best hearts go out to trying to get these boys some points this year some respect our best. damn it yeah i don't know maybe if you're listening to this donate some uh some money to to ert because for all we know they're running on <laughs> start a go fund uh, me <laughs> yeah let's start a go fund me <laughs> make ert great again <laughs> so we are gonna we are gonna start a go fund me for the ert team uh in order to try to get them some goddamn points um <laughs> but uh, I think it's about time we uh, roll over to Maserati, Dallas. Yes, Maserati MSG, not the additive that they put in Chinese food, which I learned on the first recording of this episode is that it's, it was never bad for you. It was some suburban housewives yeah. freaking out about it. Suburban moms not understanding um, culture uh, from anywhere else. These young boys, we got... Max Gunther, the Gunt, and then the rookie on the field, Jehan Deruvula. Now, Taylor, you thought it was kind of interesting that of how many wrecks the Maseratis had last year, they were going to give a seat to a green as green rookie when arguably they're still paying off loans for all the crashes from last year. What was your take when you saw that this new name was being added to the grid and that it happened to be with Maserati MSG? Yeah, I don't know. I was um, I was just confused because uh, Deruvula, historically, like his racing pedigree was never particularly impressive. Um, I feel like there probably were better outcomes, but he just landed at the point in which they needed him. Um, but to take a team that managed, I think like in, I think like six to eight wrecks, like the DNFs that Maserati had last year, um, aside from some incredible strokes of brilliance, uh, were, were pretty painful to watch. Um, the idea of tossing Deruvula in there, I don't know if he just has like a really clean driving record. They felt like the insurance policy that they were going to take yeah. on him was going to work out. Um, but it feels like like they're just paying off the damages from season nine. Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the return on the FAA credit union is for the damages that were done to the cars throughout that last season. But uh, I don't have a huge high hopes for this. Um, I do think that uh, Maxi Gunt, um, the Gunt man himself, I do think that he had some really good breakout performances last year. And I think he's probably going to continue to show and wonder um, as we go through this season as well. Uh, I do not expect to see much from Deruvula. Moving on to now some of the more legitimate teams. That's why you're here, right? You want to learn about the, the front of the pack. Jaguar TCS, uh, currently number one in the driver standings in Nick Cassidy and in the team standings. Taylor, tell me how dangerous the Jaguar car can be. Wow, yeah. Uh, probably the most consistent 
point scoring powertrain on the grid and Dallas pretty fantastic driving lineup you got the double Kiwis double of them and well if you if you do the math there are four Kiwis on this team two reside in the midsection of Mitch Evans and the other two reside in the midsection of nice guy Nick Cassidy uh, they had this uh, pretty interesting piece uh, pre Sao Paulo of how these two drivers have been competing against each other for a very long time starting out in carts they've both now ended up in Formula E and now they're both on the same team and we've talked about it kind of a uh, a bit of a tiff between these two Kiwis in search for daddy's love daddy Jaguar that is so very interesting dynamic two very good competitors that are going up against it now as teammates yeah i mean i think it is gonna be a pretty interesting season uh for mitch evans because um nice guy nick is maybe the most consistently intelligent driver on track like every time i see him race the opportunities he makes, the strategic plays he makes in order to... He almost figures things out before his race engineers do it uh, for him, like tell him what to do. Like he's already ahead of it or he has better outcomes or answers. Um, and the thing is, is that he does it with such a poise and kindness that is like almost like clinically sickening to see how talented this kid is. Like it's like... I don't know how the talent of Mitch Evans is going to stack up in the long term of this, but I, I'm worried at times that this, like this team has been Mitch Evans. You know, he's had a big stake in it. He's been the top performer for a very long time, and Nick Cassidy, additionally also New Zealander shows up and almost like takes the pride of the flag away from him and the pride of daddy Barclay away from him. Um, I'm starting to wonder because I think Mitch Evans, fantastic driver, incredible, a little more hot headed in his driving style. We forgot to mention that Nick Cassidy is like the Mr. Rogers of racing. Remember uh, London last year, he crashed out and he was going to the, the back of the team room where the, the control room, whatever you want to call it. And cameras were just following him in. And in the heat of that moment, he could have just been like, get the fuck out of here. Like I just crashed out of one of the last races of the season. Mm -hmm. I'm out of the points, but he's like, please, could, could you please, could just, you just, please a just give us just, some space? Please just a minute. Yeah. Please. We also had Michael Andretti storm into the freaking Porsche garage. Get ready to like punch a German man in the face. Speaking of, punching German men uh, in faces. We have Tag Hyun Porsche. Uh, this dynamic is <laughs> arguably the yeah. most unique because it is the only team with one human operating a vehicle, and that is in Antonio Felix da Costa. The other one, Pascal Verline, I don't think he's human. Uh, I think he is an AI super project that Porsche has been developing and is now rolling out on the Formula E grid. Uh, Taylor, what do you make of that? Pascal has never been injured in a crash. Pascal has never been seen outside of his race suit or race branded merchandise. I'm ready to see it. I we've never seen Pascal shirtless. I'm pretty sure it's just wiring. His nipples are USB ports. Yes, and that is how he's connecting with the greater the greater capacities of the car. <laughs> he plugs in <laughs> straight to his nipples. <laughs> you know, um, I I think it's fair to mention that Pascal Verlein used to be a human racing driver, raced in Formula One. Uh, he's had a career, but I think my theory is, is what happened is there was some sort of incident during testing that was near fatal, as close to near fatal as you can get without it being fatal. And I think the majority of Pascal's human form was lost in that wreck, but 
he just so happened to be the perfect candidate to install these cybernetics and this AI brain. You know, he still has some of his parts, part of his brain. It's like RoboCop, right? They rebuilt him the best that they could, uh, but he is more machine than man at this point. Yeah, we're starting to veer a little heavily into um, Formula E fan fiction, uh, frankly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I um, I think that uh, Pascal has been um, just a passion project for some engineer at Porsche for for going on a decade now. Uh, I'm sure there's been countless, countless, countless uh, Pascals that have been grown in tubes, um, try to be fit into the race seats, and maybe they have, you know, too many fingers on one arm because they can't figure out how to make hands. Um, and, and we finally got the race ready Pascal. And I think that this is going to be the year that we get Pascal finally uh, in that true championship fight. Um, I think that Antonio Felix da Costa is, after last year, feeling a little hurt by his role but i think that they have moved him more towards coaching uh the pascal personality exes to try to develop some new humor and and charisma for an otherwise terrifyingly emotionless person yeah i i think it's a tough it's tough news to get uh when you are as passionate and as skilled as Antonio Felix da Costa for your team to come to you and be like, hey, you're going to be racing this year, but that's really not the focus yet. We'll throw you in a car. We'll have you race around the track, but just know you're going to be behind Pascal. We're going to peel the curtain back a little bit. This is what we've been working on. Pascal hasn't been the Pascal that you've known of for quite some time, and we need you to train him up on being human, like you just said. And I think, is it an ideal situation for Antonio Human da Costa? No, he wants to race, he wants to win races, but I think maybe he's looking at it as a very unique opportunity in this time in human history to be part of something truly special. And so he's falling in line and doing what needs to be done to make this driver AI the pinnacle of performance which for the most part what we've seen so far is already figured out, but then also can speak to the media. It doesn't have these radio blackouts when yeah. you take pole in Mexico City. Um, I think it's coming well, along nicely. I think I don't think that at all. I think that, frankly, um, Antonio is smiling because uh, this is the first time he's seen the sun in the span of a few weeks. I think that <laughs> after the race, they yank him out of that car and they shackle him down in a windowless room and they run just like formula E interviews in front of a camera. And they just link that straight into Pascal's brain. And the reason why he's so happy to finally be on the track and finally racing, uh, is because he's, this is his first chance. He signed a dark contract, you know, <laughs> he signed a really dark contract, not knowing fully what it entailed. Uh, but we've started to see it because um, he is str starting to struggle on track. And I think that it is due to the lack of uh, sleep and probably the lack of uh, solid meals. Uh, who knows what kind of Just what kind paste. of goo they serve him? <laughs> yeah, what kind of nutrient paste uh, he just has funneled into his mouth as he's um, working his way through uh, the the interview questions that he's training Pascal for. Have you personally used any AI products like ChatGPT, Dolly, the Google Bard, uh, Grok on Twitter? Any of those? Have you used those yet? No, I'm a big anti-AI uh, advocate, but um, I have been tempted. Well, when that time comes, because it's an inevitability, it's going to become more enmeshed into our culture, our society, our world. When you do finally use it, you'll realize, oh, this 
is more efficient, just overall better at whatever the thing is of, you know, doing busy work or solving a quick problem, solving a complex problem. When you have are you, that. Are you sponsoring AI right now? I'm not sponsoring. Uh, I mean, this is like a uh, the huge discourse right now with people is like, well, what are we going to do with AI? I'm just saying in my experience with it, it is it is a game changer. I'll just say it as as loosely as that. So with me having used AI products and knowing that there is one sitting in a race seat on the grid. Yeah, it's kind of a no contest. Now, is Pascal going to win every single race? No, uh, they're still building things out. But I think Porsche is the team to beat. And I don't really think that it can fully be beat because of the current status of Pascal. The monkey is already out of the cage and it is running around and being superior to us humans. With um, a nice little goatee. With the nice little goatee that was kind of a uh, a little tweak after the main models had already been made. But like, what can we add to makes this seem more realistic? Like he is still human. And then they put on facial hair. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, I do think that Porsche is probably going to be the m biggest title threat to Jaguar. I don't know about how much or what it's going to take. Um, I have seen the power of AI firsthand. That's what I'm terrified of. It's scary. I'm terrified of Pascal and what he's capable of doing. But I also know that AI still struggles to fully comprehend the human mind. And he's got a lot of human minds to contend with on that circuit. Um, I think it's time we move to the final team on the grid. And this is one um, I have been excited to talk about since it was announced. Probably the craziest outcome of off-season moves. We got Don Ito. Go! Ito! Making a move from Maserati MSG to tiptoe his way into the Mahindra this year. I'm not entirely sure by this move, Dallas. Um, it seems kind of like a step backwards. I don't know. What do you, I don't know about you, but um, I think that Ido had historically showed like just what a formidable driver is. He's going into the back marker power unit aside from ERT for the remainder of this season. He, he was in a car that was in the points frequently. But it's just this season. And with this driver duo, uh, especially on the Formula E circuits, very talented drivers. I think once the homologation year ends after this season and the cars get built from the ground up, essentially, I think Mahindra, just based on talent of these drivers, they didn't go to Mahindra. Ito did not jump ship at Maserati to come over to Mahindra just to be like, yeah, I kind of like the, the back of the pack or near the back of the pack. Uh, I hope that something special is coming to Mahindra yeah. in the coming years because of these drivers. And also just for the sake of Ito, because uh, Ito did us a solid. You ended up finding his cameo page, which is in shockingly affordable uh, and you had a cameo for uh, for Andrew uh, one of our our mates in our our fantasy formula e league and uh, left a nice little message so shout out to Ito for taking the time uh, yeah. to leave a message we love uh, he deserves the best he deserves the best um, but I think uh, maybe the the biggest move the the biggest surprise of this um, we have maybe the most uncomfortable person you could look at partnering him the mighty mandibles himself the champion of chomp who was chewed up for the first time in his life by formula one and spit straight back out into formula e partnering him um we got nick devries uh 
who after a very struggled um, recent year over at AlphaTauri racing in Formula One, after a spectacular stand-in drive for Williams uh, when uh, Alex Albin had uh, appendicitis, uh, he put them little Dutch clogs on and uh, trotted his way straight into Formula One and managed to have maybe the most uncomfortable drive to survive episode i've ever seen where you are just like it's just it's kind of sad you know like it's the whole time tragic. just like oh i know how this ends i know how this ends i'm so sorry nick <laughs> it, <laughs> like, it was like i was so like, tragic in the arms of the angels in, <laughs> in drive to survive when they were in Monaco and he came into pit when it started raining and he's leaving the pit lane, he's like, "What button do I press for intermediates?" Like it's it's on the it's on the wheel. It's like, "What button do I press?" He didn't even know what button to press. And knowing that he is a Formula E champion from season seven, right? Yeah. Uh, and just he just shit the bed so hard in his. Not at what ha- quarter of a season at AlphaTauri? Yeah. Like, I felt so bad, but I'm so stoked to see him back in Formula E. Yeah, yeah. Me, I mean, me too. Me too. Um, I- I'm. I'll put it this way: I'm excited to see him driving. I'm not excited to see them freaky ass teeth. You know, <laughs> like, uh, like uh, there's something about his face. You know, like when people Photoshop teeth on their babies. Like how scary it looks. It's like the same look. Um, <laughs> like it, it's the most powerful jaw. The the mouth, the the jaw and mouth to head ratio is way out of whack, and the teeth are straight, and they look strong. Like I don't know what the jaw regimen is. Like, is there some sort of like metric comparison uh, in bite math of like? bite force to to racing ability dallas uh, I, th- I think with nick devries i mean uh for the most part i i think it's fair to assume that this is just genetic but he might have jumped on the jawser sizer products early on and just <laughs> as he's like running through his workouts in the sim or just like doing those <laughs> those neck workouts he's doing the jawser sizer as well so maybe yeah, that's well he's what, clearly he's clearly graduated his way all the way up to full tire uh with uh <laughs> with the growth of his jaw like uh are they are they feeding him like the the scrap from the carbon fiber after each race like this is like a bag of doritos for him like what's the deal yeah, um, I think he takes those hand cooks at the end of the race because all the jaws are sizers, he can't use them anymore. He just breaks them. He's too strong for them. His bite strength is like a fucking alligator. And so he has to move on to full blown used rubbers and just he's like a wolverine. Just It feels like we have three top drivers in this series, like locked to like a Radio Shack RC car engine. Like I'm going crazy because I know how I want to see these drivers like competitive. And every time they're on track, I'm just like, there's, they're, they're nowhere to be found. There's not even coverage. I don't know if we've seen Nick DeVries in like a driver cam since the start of the season, since he's been back, it's almost like they're almost like shooing him up, shoving him under the rug. Like, nah, he's, he's there somewhere. Nick DeVries. Who's that? It's uh well, Maybe there's uh, some sour feelings because he went off to Formula One, and now that he's back, he kind of had to come back with his tail between his legs. And yeah, it's like, hey guys, I'm I'm back. I'm your season seven champion. It's like, get the get in the fucking back, dude. You know who Jake Dennis is? You know who Pascal is? <laughs> yeah, you know who fucking Jake Dennis is. You gotta build you know the shit Jake Dennis back is? up. <laughs> When's the last time you wore rubber? You eat rubbers, okay? Yeah, fall in line. <laughs> So I, yeah, oh, I, I don't know if he's just having to like build back his his reputation again because yeah, it's kind of been crickets. Uh, it's, yeah, at it's least gonna be, on like the main, the main, the main to coverage. build that reputation back in that Mahindra is is kind of what I'm saying. It's like it's almost like Mahindra is is setting themselves up, taking a gap year before like a, a year to dominate. But I don't know if that's the right move for 
someone with a pound puppy, like uh, like a dog left at the at the shelter, like Nick DeVries, <laughs> you know. Well, the 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 problem with that is uh, maybe it is those types of dogs that have a tendency to bite are hard to rehome. <laughs> so maybe I want to make this was... clear to everyone: Nick DeVries does not bite people. He only bites your furniture. Okay. Uh, I, <laughs> he only eats your favorite shoes. He does not bite you. He's great around kids. That is the grid for season 10 circuit breakers style. And before we get out of here, uh, there are a few dynamics of the formula E races that are unique to formula E that I do want to chat about just very quickly. One is attack mode. We're all familiar with attack mode. Drivers have to drive off of the line, get that extra power boost and fall back into line. Are you a fan of attack mode, Taylor? I like attack mode. Currently, it just seems like a way to mix up racing. And yep. I'm not exactly sure the solution. I know that there's a Gen 3 like Evo evolutionary car where they're going to potentially add some new perks and things like that. They got that front powertrain in it now. Um, you know, they've unlocked that front powertrain for the for the fastest indoor speed record ever set. Um, I want to see them name. maybe like... Say who did it. Fastest man indoors, Jake Hey Penny Hughes. Anyways, I didn't um, mean to cut you off. <laughs> so you, can put, you uh, put some respect uh, on his I name. S- no, what I would I would like to see them potentially do is like maybe unlock that front powertrain for the Gen Three Evo. Um, maybe it has like a minimal role in standard, and then it has a greater implementation in activation. But my, my issue with that is that like it's going to completely change the handling characteristics characteristics of the car. Um, so I don't know, maybe it's like a activate, like launch mode or something like an additional setting that they, uh, add when that happens. But I don't, I I frankly don't know. I do know that they are going to be changing tires for the next generation of, uh, of the formula E vehicle. I don't think it'll be, I don't think it's the Evo. Um, but I think it's like 2025 or six, they've got Bridgestone that's going to be providing tires. So that'll be sick. And that'd be um, a Gen 4, right? That'd be Gen that'd 4, be yeah. Cars? Yeah. Yeah. Um, additionally, Attack Charge is uh, still to be con- confirmed as to where that's going to go. I I don't care about Attack Charge. does not matter to me. The racing is good enough as it is. This weird mix-up thing uh, just doesn't seem like it's going to add a tremendous amount to the series, but they need to showcase like developments in EV tech. And I guess rapid charging that battery is the way to do it. But I think it's going to be kind of a mess. I did just see a video today, actually, of uh, the first looks of what fast charge, like the process with the crew in the pits. And it is one of the pit members holding this huge, like two handled, big piece and then they just plugged it into the pooper on the back side of the car and the the crew member is like so far away and i'm hoping you know armed to the gills with rubber so there's no voltage jump and you immediately just explode and fly 50 feet backwards uh uh, frankly and that would be par for the course for formula e i'm ready to see it i don't want to see anyone die (laughs) like doc did you like like uh uh, what's his name? Fucking uh, Doc from uh, from Back to Back the Future. Back to the Just Future. <laughs> Morty. Uh, uh, uh. Morty. They, I fast charged. They, they said JK had been infused back in time. <laughs> it was the the first. It was a tap charge this whole time. <laughs> Just... The first test of this technology, and they accidentally <laughs> brought a Cockney Victorian Englishman into the into the fold. <laughs> Morty, I got a British guy. Oh, and the McLaren engineer just smoldering. <laughs> Jake's car gone. 
I think that is a perfect place to end. We set out to record this episode to make it better. And now we have even more lore to circuit breakers, more lore to Formula E. Uh, Bang up job. Holy shit. I'm going to. Oh, God. I can't stop crying. Well, well, hey, uh, hopefully you enjoyed this as much as we did. Uh, be sure to check us out on the socials on YouTube and Instagram. Same handle at Circuit Breakers Pod on Twitter. It's a little bit different of a handle at Talk Formula E. And as always, shout out to It's Tricky for making our fantastic intro song. We use it for the intro, the outro, beds on things. Uh, check him out on SoundCloud. Uh, just It's Tricky. The link will be down in the description on YouTube and in the show notes on audio platforms. Uh, thanks, everyone, so much for watching and listening. And uh, we got Tokyo coming up. So uh, here's another reminder. Uh, you only have a few more days until this race happens, the Tokyo e Prix, and then we record it. Come up with what Pokemon you think coincide with what Formula E drivers. Uh, just a I've friendly reminder. so many. I've already got so many. Taylor, any any final thoughts? Oh, man. This was a long fought journey to to make this episode happen and this is probably the hardest I've laughed uh at any racing endeavor in my life. Well, that's that's what we're here for. That's what we're all about. All right. Well, we will see you all after Tokyo. Goodbye. Bye. Now.